Hey, we've got a great catch for you coming up next. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to Garden to Table. Well, in today's show, we're going to talk about fish. Not so much fishing, although I'm going to try to do a little fishing today. But you know, fish is a wonderful heart healthy protein. And today we're going to talk about how to select fish as well as prepare fish in some delicious ways. In today's show, as you know, it doesn't get much fresher than catching it yourself. We're going to go fishing for crappie and cook up the catch of the day. And later I'll share a couple of fantastic side dishes that will go with any filet. We've got a lot to cover today, so why don't we get started with Peter Brave, a man who knows his fish. Right, I'm Peter Brave, uh, Brave New Restaurant. Uh, came to talk about fish this morning, a little fresh fish. We're kind of known for doing fresh seafood down here at the restaurant, and so uh, I was going to hopefully share a few tips on how to buy it at the store and then how to cook some in the kitchen. Let's go ahead and start talking about how to get fish at the market. First way you're going to go ahead and do any kind of purchasing any fish is visually. If the fish doesn't look bright is the word they use in the seafood industry, you probably shouldn't even take the next step because it's uh, uh, probably not going to be worth it. But you want to use all your senses. You'll start off by seeing if the fish has a nice skin color, if you have a fish that's whole, you want to look for nice clear eyes, you want to look for gills that still have some red in them, and then just a nice firmness to the fish is also what you're looking for. In a whole fish, it's a little bit easier to identify some of these things than it is in a filleted fish. So if you go to the market and you're looking for a filleted fish, it might come out looking somewhat like this. Looking for the same characteristics, the fish should be nice and bright, shouldn't have any kind of dingy color to it whatsoever. If you have the, the option of going ahead and touching it, then that's fine. You can go ahead and make sure it's nice and firm. It should always bounce back whenever you kind of give it a little bit of a touch. So this one has got no skin and no other kind of fresh characteristics. You're just going simply on the way it looks and the way it feels. Now, if you might find a fish that looks like this at the market, this is a farm raised trout, but you're able to use some of the same characteristics you would use for a whole fish. Look for a nice bright color on the outside of the skin nice bright color on the inside of the flesh also. Should be no yellowing or any kind of colors like that, any kind of discoloration. So that's another fish you'll be looking at. Here's a, another way a fish might be in the market. It'll be skin on, but completely off the bone. Once again, won't have the eyes or the gills to make any kind of reference for freshness, but you can tell with this, it's still got nice yellow and green color in the skin, uh, and that's a good indication of freshness. Flipping it over, same kind of characteristics we're looking for here nice and bright, no yellowing, no off color or anything like that. And the fish itself is very firm and has no smell whatsoever. Uh, it might smell a little bit on the outside uh, like the ocean or, or, or a river or something like that, but should never have any stronger smell than that. That's gonna be an indication of age uh, or just mishandled fish. So those are most of the characteristics you're looking for in buying seafood, which is gonna be the key to any kind of seafood recipe. We're going to go ahead and put together a little sauce that's going to go with the fish we talked about earlier. Today it's going to be a beautiful piece of walleye. It comes out of Lake Superior. Uh, real light sauce. It should accompany the fish more than kind of cover it up. If you're going to go take the effort to do this beautiful fish purchasing, uh, you want to do a nice light sauce to go with it. So this is kind of a little bit of a fruit beurre blanc, if you will. So we're going to start off with is just one medium-sized shallot here. We're going to build all this into this skillet right here and then reduce it down to finish the sauce. So we'll start off with this shallot here diced up nice and fine. All right, start off with him in the skillet there. Do a little bit of a kiwi here. We'll just peel it. We're going to dice all this stuff. This is going to be reduced down with white wine and vermouth. So the cutting of it is going to be not real important because it's going to kind of fall apart as it heats up and dissolves in the reduction. So you just kind of want to give it a rough chop along the lines of that. We'll do a couple of strawberries. We'll save one of those over there for a garnish at the very end. A 
All right, then we'll do a, a little section of a grapefruit and some orange here. I'll give it a little bit of twang. Beautiful red grapefruit here. We'll go ahead and just take about maybe a half a dozen segments here, put them in the reduction. Like that. Do the same with an orange. something like that. What I want to do now is add probably about three or four tablespoons of white wine and about two or three tablespoons of some nice dry vermouth. All right, and that's going to be our reduction. Now at this point, I want to transfer this over to the stove and I'm going to reduce down basically all of the moisture out of the fruits that we've got here and the wine and the uh, vermouth. So we're going to take that over here. Now I want to do it in a nice wide flat skillet like that because it'll kind of help the reduction go down. Uh, it'll help it reduce down quicker. So we start off with it like that, like I said, about three or four tablespoons of white wine, two or three tablespoons of vermouth. Then, after it reduces down, we're kind of looking for something like this. And you can see that the vast majority of all the moisture is gone from the skillet. The fruit has kind of started to break down a little bit, so it wasn't really important that I cut it up too fine because it'll just, by the process of reducing down, will just kind of break up a little bit. Now, what we've got here now is a little bit of honey that I want to add to this to bring a, a little bit of a sweet element to the, to the recipe. Probably just about a, what's that, about a tablespoon or so. And then this one is important. You don't want to reduce it down too far. If you reduce it down too far, what happens is the skillet's going to get too hot. And when you start to whisk in this butter, instead of it incorporating and becoming a nice emulsified sauce, it'll actually split. So I've got, oh, let's say one stick of butter right here. I'm going to just go ahead and, and, and a pat at a time, kind of start whisking that into this reduction. You can see instead of it just melting, it actually is kind of turning into a cream sauce, if you will. So this is a, a, a variation of a beurre blanc, a, a traditional kind of French sauce. Once again, you can see how it's doing if I'm keeping it moving constantly like that, by moving the whisk and by moving the skill at the same time, come down a little bit on that temperature. The butter, instead of melting and splitting, it's staying in a nice emulsified kind of form. And that's what's going to make our sauce. All right, I'm going to turn the heat off there after all that butter has been melted. The only thing I want to do now is just adjust the seasoning on it. A little bit of chef salt here. Like that, and that's going to be the sauce that's going to go on top of that fish. So you can see the before. Got all that extra moisture reduced out of there, replaced it with a little bit of butter that we whisk in there, and that's the sauce that's going on, on top of a beautiful piece of uh, fresh walleye this evening. All right, now we've got this fish. What I did with this was I just went ahead and brushed a little bit of butter on the bottom of the pan and a little bit of butter on the top of the fish, hit it with a little bit of seasoned salt, and broiled it just for about five or six minutes in the oven. The key to any seafood is not overcooking it and you want to cook it until it just starts to flake apart. You can tell right in here is where it's kind of the flakes are starting to fall apart. That's exactly what you're looking for. So I want to serve it up with a nice slotted spatula there. I've got it served with a little bit of starch and a couple of vegetables over here. And then we've got that beautiful sauce that we went ahead and made over here just a second ago. Just put a little bit of that right on top of the fish. Give it a nice accompaniment to it without kind of covering it up too much. Then I saved one of these pretty strawberries over here. We'll just put a little bit of slice on the strawberry. Just use that for a garnish on the side of the plate. I think that pretty much would do it right there.
Just take a look at this cabbage. Look at the size of it. It's a Whopper. Well, this is actually an OS hybrid. And for OS hybrids, this is actually a small example of what you can produce in your own garden. OS, by the way, stands for oversized. These cabbages can weigh up to 50 pounds. Cabbage is really an easy vegetable to grow. It's perfect for the beginner gardener, and it's an excellent plant to get kids involved in gardening. You just have to follow a few basic steps to be successful. Cabbages can be planted in the spring and fall because they like cool weather. So in the spring, be sure you plant your cabbage plants early enough so you'll have plenty of time to grow them out before it gets hot. In the fall, plant at least six to eight weeks before the first hard frost. You'll find that cabbage plants like cool weather and actually become hardened off and are more tolerant of light frost when they've been exposed to cool temperatures. Not to mention cabbage that matures in cool weather is deliciously sweet. You'll also want to make sure that you find a sunny spot with loose, well-drained soil. Make sure you give your plants plenty of space. For instance, with this OS Hybrid, they recommend that these be spaced three feet apart. I know it sounds outrageous, but they can get really large. Other cabbage varieties are smaller and you can get more heads of cabbage per square feet. After planting the cabbage plants, apply an all-purpose vegetable fertilizer around the base. And then be sure to give your cabbage consistent water. It needs at least an inch of water or supplemental water each week. Although cabbage like cool temperatures, you'll want to cover your cabbage overnight if the temperatures drop below 32 degrees. And just remember to remove the covering before the day gets warm. And one last thing, you want to be on the lookout for cabbage loopers. You see, this caterpillar likes all members of the coal family, including cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, and collards. If you see them, spray them with BT. You can get this at your local farm supplier garden center. BT is perfectly safe for spraying on anything you eat. I think cabbage is one of those vegetables that you either love it or you don't really like it at all. I love cabbage anyway. Raw, I like it. Baked, I like it. Cooked in any form. What I'm doing here is a very simple recipe that's great for a fish fry. It's coleslaw. And it's using a green goddess dressing. So what I've done here is I've just taken a sort of medium to large head of cabbage. I split it in half. And in this piece, I cored out the, the center of it. And what I've done is I've shredded about a third of the head of cabbage. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of that now and I'm going to place it over into this bowl. This recipe is really, really tasty and it's perfect for taking out to a fish fry or to a picnic. All right, now let's get started on the dressing. What we have over here is a series of ingredients that I'm going to use. Uh, we'll start out with half a teaspoon of salt and I'm going to take one garlic clove. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna crush it first, just with the flat side of the knife like that. And throw that puppy in there. And then what we're gonna do is take a half a teaspoon there of white pepper and half a teaspoon of mustard, yummy. And then anchovies, this is anchovy paste, two tablespoons of anchovy paste. Now don't sneer your nose really good. It blends in. You don't even know it's there, but it adds such an intense flavor. And then what we're going to do is add some uh, tarragon vinegar made from white wine vinegar. And there are three tablespoons of that. Now with all that in, I'm going to mix that uh, together in the blender. Okay, that just about does it. All right, now we're ready for the green part of the green goddess dressing. So I'm going to go ahead and take this off. <clears throat> and I have a third of a cup of minced green onions, happy to save from the garden, and some flat leaf Italian parsley, the same volume, third of a cup. Just right in there like that. Okay, and now I'm going to give it another shot with a blender. Mm, good enough, I guess. But what we'll do is we're about to add the fun creamy stuff so that'll make sure all that green stuff gets blended together. So what I have here is a half a cup of sour cream. Yum, yum. Love sour cream. And you will too in this recipe. And a full cup of mayonnaise. Yes, some mayonnaise. Yum, yum. All right. So... There's that. Let's get the top back on this. We just about have it done. 
Beautiful. And make sure it all blends together. Yeah. Oh, it smells so good, too. Okay, I think we're there. Mm-mm. Yeah, just take a look at that. Look how creamy and green. Oh, okay, now it's time to pour it over the cabbage. <clears throat> just look at that. Okay. And this recipe is enough for well, probably five people, but if I'm around, it would only be enough for like two people. Um, because I would get like seconds and thirds. So we're going to mix this together. And what's great is you can make the dressing ahead of time and then just chop your cabbage. And if you like yours a bit drier, just add more cabbage. And one thing that I've done as well is I'll sometimes take a white or even a yellow onion and add to it, I like a little onion in my slaw, and plenty of cracked pepper. Give it a try, you're gonna love it. Hey, now take a look at this table setting. It's really casual. The idea is to make it easy, the kind of thing you can set up, you can go fishing, you can come back with your catch, serve them up to friends, in a really relaxed atmosphere like this. We just took one of our old farm tables and covered it with a piece of fabric that I picked up at a junk store. And I've used it, it doesn't even cover the entire table and it's not hemmed, but who cares? You know, it just adds to the casual ambience of this tablescape. Now let's talk about some of the other elements that I've used here. Um, what I think is really fun is the fact that we just use these boards. These have come in really handy. Um, I just took one by 12 boards and cut them uh, where they're 12 inch square and we just wrapped them with some brown paper and then I'm using these skillets. You can use these six inch skillets to serve directly in and they can be warm. They can have a little grease on the bottom of them. It's no big deal because you're setting them on a board that's wrapped in paper. The paper just adds to the ambience. And then if you look at these serving pieces, I've added some skillets a Dutch oven here in the center, so maybe we have chili or some kind of soup. Down on the end, I've got an old basket that can be used for serving up bread of any kind, corn muffins, hush puppies, whatever. And then through the middle, what I've done here is use some little galvanized buckets. Uh, these I've filled with peanuts, so while guests are waiting to be served, they can have some uh, peanuts, and just throw the hulls on the ground. And then I've used them also to hold the, the flatware and just bound them with some burlap ribbon, which just adds to the, the rustic charm of the setting. And then if you take a look at the ends, I've got some larger galvanized buckets uh, that are holding ice, and I've iced down some, some beverages for guests. And then I've used some ironstone out of the kitchen. I collect this old ironstone, so this will be great for slaw or salad. And probably the two most ordinary things on the table would be these paper towels for napkins and these fruit jars for drinking glasses, for tea or ice water or whatever you want. It's always great fun to eat outdoors and the overhang of this barn is perfect. Here on this wall, we've carried the theme over here to set the mood using baskets and old fishing creels and rods and reels. You see the idea is just use ordinary things, get creative and have a little fun. Well, the entire club embraces a little over 1,100 acres. Before the Depression, uh, this was one of the old clubs in the Mid-South and consists primarily of three lakes, two of which are old Mississippi River bends. But then during the Depression, the club fell on bad times. Many of the members resigned and as a result, the club ceased to be. But then uh, after the Depression, the club revived and some of the old members started it again. I like to refer to our membership as, as gentlemen sportsmen. Favorite of everyone, catching bass, brim, when the brim are spawning, and also crappie. These are black crappie. 
I'm Rebecca Sims. I've been here for eight years at Minishe. We're going to have crappie caught from Minishe Lakes. I dip it in a well-beaten eggs. Then I just I bread it in a cracker meal, cornmeal mix mixture with seasonings. Seasonings may vary, but I do like the eggs well beaten. I'm frying this in canola oil. And the temperature is about medium high. I like to cook about three to four pieces at a time. It'll turn golden brown and float to the top. If it gets brown before it's floating, it's not quite done enough. And I'll put it on the paper towel to absorb some of the oil. Nice and golden brown, crisp, the way they like them. You know, I love the story behind food. Hush puppies, for instance, the name comes from creating these wonderful little cornbread confections and throwing them in after the fish is fried and pitching those to the dogs to keep them from yapping and barking for more. So I'm gonna show you how to make hush puppies the way I do it, which is kind of fun, uh, very delicious. What we're taking here is a cup and a half of self-rise yellow cornmeal, and I've got a half cup of self-rise flour mixing that all together. And then I'm gonna take a half a teaspoon of baking soda here, we'll get all these dry ingredients first, and a half a teaspoon of salt. So I'm just gonna make sure that that's all mixed together using this wood spoon. All right, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and add some of the bits from the garden. Took a medium-sized yellow onion, chopped it. I like it kind of chunky, you can make the the onions much smaller by mincing them smaller if you like. And then I took a jalapeno pepper, fresh one, and it's minced. I'm just gonna evenly mix all this together. All right, so those are our dry ingredients and our things fresh from the garden. And it's time to work on the wet ingredients. I'm gonna start with one cup of buttermilk. And I'm just gonna combine that with one one egg, let's crack it here and make sure this is one of the eggs from our heritage birds out in the hen house, or one of the hen houses. I'm gonna mix all this together. I've got a Dutch oven with 10 cups of peanut oil in it on medium heat. It's been going for a while, and because uh, you wanna get it up to about 350 degrees. All right, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the liquid, pour it in here, and then mix all this together. What we want to do is make a nice kind of firm batter. This is the kind of thing you want to get your hands in. What I'm doing is I'm really trying to mix all the wet and the dry and just make sure that it's fully integrated here. So you can see the consistency. And um, now let me just wipe off my hands here. Then I'm going to take a metal spoon I like to use a little water here just to clean off the spoon as we dip these out. Kind of get a shape like this. Just drop them in. Watch them fry. And I just dip it in a little water, make sure that the hush puppy falls off. You can make these any size you want. This recipe will make about 35 small ones. Um, I'm making them a little large, so I'm probably going to only get about 18 out of them. This is what you want here. You want them golden brown and they cook really fast. You want to watch them. A lot of fun to make and people love them. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed this little fishing expedition as much as I have. Until next time, good eating and good health.